Hello, everybody. Yes, these are not Florida colors. These are not Auburn colors. These are the proud colors of the fighting Illini. <laughs> it's, uh, I'll echo what's been said this morning already. It has been good for my soul to be here. Uh, I have meted so many wonderful people this weekend. It has been great. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Sorry. <laughs> it really has. It's, uh, you know, there's just times where God just comes along and when you're just a little dried up, you know, that flower that's just starting to wilt, but then just comes that shower so that you can continue to grow again and bloom again. And that's what you guys have been for me this weekend. And, you know, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I'm super excited to, to share about my family and my, my students. And so today what we're just going to do, I'll take some moments to tell you kind of how life works for us in doing this kind of ministry. And then we'll get into... Uh, a passage of scripture in Joshua 22 and, and get some points from that. Uh, we call ourselves the Illini Initiative, our ministry, because we work there at the University of Illinois where the fighting Illini are. Uh, we are the oddball missionaries with IM. We are international missionaries serving in the foreign field of the state of Illinois. <laughs> and, uh, but we are not missionaries because of whom we serve or because of where we serve, but rather whom we serve. And that's what you will see uh, in these pictures, and so hopefully I'll be able to do this. Uh, Tori, you don't have to stand up here. And, <laughs> so this is the initiative. This has been the initiative from day one is for us to reach a community that can reach a student, that can reach a world. And how we are doing that is then starting a Fruo Baptist Church. We're a part of that, and you'll see just a little bit of that. Um, but then our family and with that church, we reach international students who then when they leave, they can then go back, not just with a degree from the University of Illinois, but can go back with the gospel to then take that all across the world. And so we kind of see ourselves as almost like a shipping station of the gospel, that so many people come in from 100 different nations. There are over 15,000 international students on our campus. And then we're just trying to put the light of Jesus into them that it then just goes back out uh, from our little cornfields of central Illinois. So there's the fam. Uh, that's the best part of me. Uh, my wife is Kelly. My oldest son, he is now as tall as I am. So this picture, I think, was last, you know, last year. He's grown like six inches in a year. Mm -hmm. And the kid has, is this big, but somehow he eats more than anybody I know. <laughs> He's costing me a fortune. Uh, his name is Mason. And then my daughter... Uh, Mason's 15, and the daughter is Millie. Millie is 14, and then Madden there with the hat on, he is 10. Uh, Madden's adopted from South Korea, and he's just been a, an awesome part of our life. We've had him eight years. We got him when he was about two, and uh, that's, that is the family, and we are international mission. I am not an international mission. We are international missions uh, as the Penn family serving our international students, and so we are at the University of Illinois. It is the uh, a top five university for international student enrollment. Um, we're not very good at football, <laughs> but we are good at you know, engineering, computer science, and these things that these students from all across the world were highly ranked in many of these areas where they are looking to, to go to school. And so what does that mean, the top five? So that just means out of all your colleges and universities in the United States, there are basically more international students on our campus there in Champaign-Urbana than just about any other campus you'll find in all of the United States. And, um, and we're just uh, about 100,000 people in the middle of cornfields is where we are. I had my shirt on yesterday, said Flatlander. That's me. <laughs> I get motion sickness on a lawnmower. And so, I'm sorry, I, I love to look at the mountains, but this is not a place for me. <laughs> so when we started this ministry, it was about 6,400 international students, and now there are about 15,000. And it was just within uh, about five years that this explosion of growth happened, 
and it really happened under the, with the undergrads, um, especially through China. Um, six to 7,000 students just simply from China will be on our, our campus, and there are about 70% of the students I deal with are East Asian, China, Taiwan, Mongolia, and then about 30% everywhere else under the sun from, you know, basically not too many Africans, but about every other flag here represents, especially Brazil. We got a good group of Brazilians, Colombians, Venezuela, Argentina, Spain. Uh, one of my favorite all-time couples is Spaniards, uh, just uh, wonderful people. And so that's why we are under international missions, though we're living and serving in the state of Illinois, is because we serve and reach out to these international students who come from all over the globe to study there. And let me tell you about these students real quick. They are the brightest of the bright walking the face of the earth. Uh, I have students who are working on tape that you just put on your, your hand and it will give your phone your blue close, blue close. <laughs> there you go, Chris. It's, I shouldn't have done it now. It's gotta be all uh, your glucose levels, your sugar levels, your blood levels. And it's just that little, you won't even ever see it, but it'll just be reading always to your phone. I have another student, when I say student, she's 40 something, but um, she's working on quantum electronics. She was the dean of a college in, to, in Vladivostok, Russia, where she is working on quantum electronics to fit in a quantum computer that hasn't been invented yet. Uh, we have another guy who's actually doing all the theory of quantum technology and all he's doing is the formulas and that's all he ever does is math formulas to figure out the quantum technology so that her doing the electronics can then work and it's <laughs> my son he was over we have a cooking conversation group and he was over for that that's what we do with these people we cook them hamburgers <laughs> yeah So my kids were actually home from school that day and they ate with us on that Friday and I was taking Mason somewhere that day and he said, Dad, is that one of the smartest kids or smartest people I'll ever meet? He's like, yes, son, that will be one of the smartest people you will ever meet. But I could go to your children's church and give them the same test that I give my students and your children's church would pass with flying colors and my students would fail every question if that quiz was over Jesus. Um, they have absolutely no idea who Jesus is. Uh, I'll take them to a, a Christmas play, and on the way home from the Christmas play, they'll say, Tyler, who were the guys up there with the staffs, the hooks? And we know them to be? Yeah, the shepherds. And then they're like, well, there was these three guys with crowns came down. Who were those? And we know them to be the wise men. And then I couldn't believe they asked this question. It was one of the questions that will stand with me all time. And they said, Tyler, why was there a baby on stage? At a Christmas play, why was there a baby on stage? And that's because all that's been kind of transported to them is ho, 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 and a deer with a red nose, and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so these students have very little time here at the University of Illinois. Um, normally you think of like 18 to 22 year olds and we have some of those that are there for four years but mostly we're getting like grad students who are there to masters or um, PhD or visiting scholars and so time is is really important to us and while they're here we just want to love them and serve them that they can have a relationship with us so that they can have an opportunity where we can come across and tell them about Jesus and so I just want to kind of flow through quickly hear how this works. So we've partnered with the Bridge Church. It's a church plant. Uh, just started two years ago. And uh, Jamie is the pastor of that church. He is to be the community pastor, you know, reaching Tom, the electrician, Sue, the nurse. And then my job is to go with the international students and then help Tom and Sue come to have a heart for international students so that then they can have these students into their home and love them and that the gospel can be exponentially greater than just our family. And so that's kind of the connection between the Bridge Church and, and our family involved in that. And so this is how ministry works for us. We connect to invite to create. And this will work for you just as much as it works for us. This is what I love about our ministry. Um, this is what you can do too. 
And it, it translates not just to international students, it translates to your coworkers, it translates to your neighbors, is that we connect to invite to create. And uh, so here's how we connect. We have partnered with a student organization called the English Corner. And all that is is conversational English, American culture, and you know, just kind of global friendships. It's a place where students want to come to practice English and learn more about America. So this is what an opening week would look like normally. This year, everybody's online. This has been one of the saddest Septembers I've had in years because this is what I'm normally meeting for the first time is what you see in this year, just it can't happen. And so we'll meet 100 international students that first week and shake hands and, hello, I'm Tyler, who are you? Iftikhar, Iftikhar, where are you from? Pakistan, oh, awesome, what are you doing? Study mathematics, great for you, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How are you, Yawin, Yawin, nice to meet you. Taiwan, oh, awesome. And so that's what I do the very first you know, week is just meeting people to then start this cycle. And that's all, they're there for English, practicing English and, uh, and, and American culture. And so from this, we do conversation partners, uh, these smaller conversation groups. So what English Corner is, is, is really three things. Thursday night, we do large group English Corner. It's about a space this size, about 50 or 60 international students. And it's just, you know, September would be like American restaurants, how to date in America, American football. Because football around the world is known as soccer. So I have to get out my son's Legos and I build these Lego football players and I got the orange and blue dominating the scarlet and gray. <laughs> so yeah, we try to teach how football is played because it's something they're interested in. They want to know more about America and that's what Thursday nights is, is, is English Corners. It's this fun group activity. And then throughout the week we host about a dozen conversation groups that's like two to eight people. And uh, I have three that are themed conversation groups that aren't just the regular ones. And this is one that you see is a cooking conversation group my wife and I do every Friday morning. And we'll bring eight students from campus to our house. And then we just cook American food of, um, you know, like hamburgers and french fries. I cook a mean goulash. Um, just we do fried fish, which is really fun because um, they're always especially the Asians are always like, where's the fresh fish? Because usually it's right there in the aquariums when you walk in and they just bring the fish to your table kind of thing there. And so they're always wanting fresh fish. Well, my dad is a big fisherman. He can outfish possum any day of the week. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so he always has crappie ready to go and, and we'll get into this conversation because they eat fish differently. And so it's a good change of culture so we f we fillet it and we fry it that's how we love fish and yeah <laughs> the heavenly way but they eat it whole and so there was actually one group that actually caught we have a little pond out behind our house i caught the fish and actually showed them how we filleted it and when i threw it they were like what are you doing like there's still a lot of food that you just threw away <laughs> And one of our favorite students, Serena, my mom was there on a cooking conversation group. One time a semester, we'll do baking pies. And my mom comes and helps them show how to bake an apple pie, cherry pie. And Serena was there. We were talking about fish. And she goes, oh, my favorite part of the fish is its eyes. And she could see that got to my mom. And so she kept going. It's like, oh, I love when I pop, pop, pop it in my mouth and it just squirts inside there. And I was like, Serena, stop. And, uh, but they do. They love the eyes. It's a delicacy. And they, and they're growing up. At, their parents tell them it makes them smarter. I'll be dumb. I can tell you that. <laughs> and so this is, you know, all we're trying to do is connect. This is how we connect is through this service of providing English to these students and a, an American cultural experience. Our family is a, ha, come and see what an American family is like. And so that's what our conversation groups are about. And so from that connection of the English corner, we then invite. So that's the second part. We are now inviting into our lives, uh, invitation to our home, invitation to our family, invitation to go into our holidays. We invite to Thanksgiving. Well, I'll just show you what it looks like. So here's, um, again, this is a sad picture to me because normally this month we'd be having our first cookout at our house. 
And so we'd have 20, 30 international students having a Chicago-style hot dog for the first time they've ever had that experience before. And then they'd have a s'more. Anybody like s'mores? Yeah. And so they have never experienced a s'more. It's so foreign to they cook the marshmallow, and of course they always burn it the first time. And then, you know, they put the graham crackers, and I had a Brazilian, Thais, her husband Wander and Thais were there, and Thais popped that into her mouth, and I mean, Portuguese just flew out. <laughs> and I don't know what she said, but I think it was, oh, this is so good. Uh, and so that's, and this is what we love, because it's, you know, it's, it's old stuff to us. I mean, just cooking a s'more, something you've probably done from a, a little kid on, and, but for them it, to experience the very first time, and you get to be a part of that, and it's just, it's just sharing life. It's building a relationship, building a friendship. And that's what we are wanting to do. And when they come to our house, then it's, you know, especially the students who aren't very comfortable with their English, they'll kind of avoid us a little bit, Kelly and I, but they'll play soccer with our kids. And so they'll be out there kicking the soccer ball or they'll be bumping the volleyball with my daughter. And because you can kick a goal and woohoo, that is international. That crosses all, all languages. And once they kind of get you know, connected with our kids and they get more comfortable, then they'll kind of navigate towards us and we can have better conversations. And it's just an amazing, you know, factor that our kids play in this whole endeavor that we're trying to do. And they'll take them up to the room, show them their Legos and, and all different kinds of things. There's what the cookout looks like. Super Bowl, try watching 20 people, you know, the Super Bowl with 20 people have absolutely no idea what's going on. <laughs> And that's what we do every February. And again, it's just, this is the spring event. The first time people come to our home in the spring is the Super Bowl event. And uh, to watch that there. Last Super Bowl, there was 20 international students at our house. And it ended up, 19 of them were watching my son play a video game in the back room while one of them was watching the Super Bowl with us. That's how it ended up working. Thanksgiving, we invite to our home to Thanksgiving dinner. Um, we just lost, you lost signal too. That's okay. And so we cook, my wife is an amazing cook, does all the traditional you know, Thanksgiving dinner, but then they'll bring some food. So we've had you know, flan from Ecuador. We've had Brazilian brigadilla. We've had you know, Yi in that picture that you can't see. He brought uh, spicy chunked fish. And I told my brother what I had for Thanksgiving. He said, Tyler, you lost me at Chunked. <laughs> and, uh, but it was good. I liked it. And then a blueberry Korean pie. Anybody ever ever had a blueberry Korean pie before? Nope. All it was was a Korean who wanted to bring something, so he looked on the Internet. He's an engineer student, got the recipe, baked a blueberry pie, and brought it. <laughs> and it was good. Uh, that's... And that's you know, Thanksgiving is such a special time because they, it's, they know that it's a family you know, holiday. And so the students that come to our home for Thanksgiving are very special to us. Uh, you'll see out on the table as you walk out, there's a pumpkin. And I know when you think Illinois corn, but we're also very, you know, the, the largest state of producing pumpkins. Um, we, we'll put on a Thanksgiving dinner for our students at English Corner on campus. So we'll have about 100 international students that we'll feed Thanksgiving dinner to. And before they come through the line, we'll have them sign the pumpkin. And so if you want to try to read some names of our students, you can have fun with that challenge as you walk out of here this evening or this afternoon. And so Thanksgiving, though, at our house is the students that are close to us. And they, they realize this and they know that this is a big deal, that they become our family. And so that's how my kids... That's going to be their Thanksgiving. Mine was going to Grandma and Grandpa's house. But that is not my kids' Thanksgiving. My kids' Thanksgiving is they stay home, and the international students come over, and we have Thanksgiving with them. Then the next day, we'll travel to the grandparents' house, but, but that day is, is with our students. And so then we do Christmas baking. Um, and just all this is is an invitation into our home so that relationship takes place. It changes the dynamic from kind of the student facilitator on campus to now friend, to now Tyler cares about us, the family. We love being with the family. And, and so the guy with the beard, he's, he's from Spain. That's Miguel. Man, that dude is full of energy and life. He brought so much joy to our whole event there. 
And so yeah, just this picture is like Spain, uh, China, Morocco, Thailand, Mexico, and Vietnam. That's every oh, there's Taiwan. There's Paul there on the end under, under Kellen. So that's that's what's our family, and that was just a Christmas baking day where my wife is the head Keebler elf, and uh, for six hours we just bake what you see on the table there, and then we just again have opportunities to be able to share about what Christmas is, why we celebrate it, and the importance of Jesus, and this whole thing. Easter is our favorite day of the year. Uh, again, it was so sad to not be able to have it this year because of COVID. But normally what happens is we invite students to spend Easter with us. So let's say you're the English corner. So you can pick a country that you want to be from. You got your country. And so we would then invite you as people who have never experienced Easter before, would you like to experience an American Easter with an American family? There'd be three things. One, you will go to church with us. Two, you will have an American Easter meal with us. And three, you'll play the Easter games with my kids. <laughs> and so we have taught somewhere around 70 international students we've taken to Easter. And probably 64 or five of them, it was their first time ever to step foot inside of a church. And that's usually when we take people to church, it is their very first time to ever experience a church service. And that's what you see here. This was a super special Easter. It actually snowed four inches that Easter, and we took that group sledding. And uh, one of our students had just had a baby, so her parents actually came to Easter service all the way from China. It was their first time to ever experience anything with you know, faith in that situation. That, uh, this was such a special time, and uh, Easter is so gospel-filled for us because we get to take them to church. That's a part of experiencing with us. And then over the meal, we're able to ask, what did you think of church? How was service for you? I'll never forget, the, 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 it was the second time we did this. I, on the way back, we were driving a student in a, in a van, and, and a student said this. He said, Tyler, while I was at church, he said, Tyler, it felt like somebody was speaking to me on the inside. I thought, man, that is, that's what, that's why we're doing what we're doing. And so that's, uh, you know, why Easter is such a special day for us. So we, we connect through English on the campus. We invite into our lives to create these pathways of faith, to create opportunities to invite to church, to create to, we do Bible studies with these students and to create conversations of faith. And UA is just a, an example of one of our precious students who went through this whole process and one of the saddest moments I had was with a student when I left her because she was not a believer uh, with when I left her and just tears flowed down my eyes driving away because I felt she was so close but she had graduated was moving out to the west coast um, and it was three years later actually my wife had been to San Francisco for a conference met with you way a couple years later and then after that that summer I got a Facebook message said Tyler I think you would want to know that I'm now a Christian Amen. just Amen. I just wanted you to know that thank you so much for helping me know God and that's just you know, we connected with her at the English corner she came to about everything we invited to and uh, we it just created these opportunities where I could talk to you way about faith, about Jesus, about church. She was in a conversation group I have called Big Questions of Life. And uh, I loved having her in there because she was, she was a student who was super bold in her questions. And she would just simply ask, Tyler, what happens to you if your kids don't become Christians? And I would then get to answer how devastating, why I want my kids to be Christians so much. And, and the other students who would never ask a question like that would get to all that would flow from her bold questions. And so this is what we're about. Uh, there's Ting Li, another, she's from Taiwan. We actually got to be with Ting Li in Taiwan last summer. Uh, she became a believer through our, our ministry here and then we got to see her. She took us to the night markets in Taiwan with some of the greatest food, uh, according to some people. Um, she took us to have chodofu, which is translated stinky tofu. And you've ever smelled something truly awful then thought oh let's put that in my mouth that is <laughs> what we experienced there with uh, Ting Li but yeah stinky tofu is a big part of Taiwanese food many of them love it some of them are that do not we we didn't 
particularly care for it. Uh, but there are some food we did absolutely love, but chodofu is not one of them. And so this is our ministry. Uh, and I'm not going to take you through all the Asia. Well, so this is last summer. There we are. That's with Ting Li at the night market. And that's uh, meeting with her. And so I'm just going to fast forward. This last summer, this was an amazing trip that we got to take. We got to visit 20 of our past students in Macau, Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Seoul, Korea. And there's the, the, the collage of that group of meetings with our, our family. And it was so validating of what we've done because they took care of us. And they would say, you know, we would say, oh, we're going to get our meal. And they'd say, no, you're not getting your meal. It's like, we, we ate at your house like seven times. We're, you got six more times to come back and for us to cover your meal. And uh, it was such a, just a precious time to, to be with our students in their home country and, and just to see what they were doing. And so that's, that's our ministry. You know, that's just a glimpse of kind of this is every day for us. This is what we do. We just cycle the same thing over and over and over again. What changes is the students. And... Uh, changes from where they're from, their beliefs, their backgrounds, and we just try to adjust on you know, how that works. If we have Muslims who are coming from Iran, then instead of having hamburgers or french fries, we, you know, we, we, fish, you know, we switch the food. We just switch to adjust to who they are so that then we can best you know, show them the love of Christ. And that's, that's what we do. I love it, absolutely. I can't believe I get to do what I get to do. As Neil, Friday night, he told me, he's like, and you got the best job. You just get to take people fishing. <laughs> and that's what I do. I take my, this past summer, I took students fishing. Uh, Ching Ching and Shu Yu. Shu Yu caught a two-pound catfish and was excited till Ching Ching caught an eight-pound channel. <laughs> she was blown away. But while I'm fishing... On the trip there or the trip back, that's an hour from where we fish. That's conversation, and guess what I get to have a conversation about? I'm fishing for men. And so we get to have a conversation about, have you been to a church yet? Have you, you know, what is your faith background? And, and get to have a conversation about Jesus. And so that's why I do what I do uh, with these students. If you have your Bibles, turn to Joshua 22. It's going to be very simple this morning, just simply a passage of Scripture, two stories and a name, and we'll wrap things up. I guess if you were going to title this sermon, it would be called a sermon, or an, it actually would be called an altar called Ed. That would be the name of this sermon, an altar called Ed. Now there are some wonderful altar names in the Bible. You know, Moses, after he had the victory where he held the staff over his his head, he built an altar, and it was Jehovah Nisa, which simply means the banner of the Lord, like the God brought victory here. Um, Gideon, he called an altar Jehovah Shalom, which is God of peace. I have no idea who was in charge of naming this altar in Joshua 22. They built this altar, and I don't know who they put, like, hey, Billy, what do you think we should call this altar? Well, Joe, that altar right there, that looks like an Ed to me. <laughs> Let's just go with Ed. So there's an altar called Ed. But actually, Ed is translated means witness. So some of your translations will actually say, and they name the altar witness. And this is what we're doing this morning, is we're using this altar to reflect what we should be as witnesses for Christ. For Jesus, on the day that he ascended, he told his followers, which then comes all the way to us 2,000 years later, that, behold, you're going to receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you to be what? Witnesses. Both here in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the end of the world. And so today that's what we're looking at is this issue of witness. And it's going to be a witness for worship through replication, right? That's everything we're talking about today is this idea of to be a witness that leads to worship, but its effective witness is through replication. And that's what the altar of Ed is all about. So let's, um, 
Joshua chapter 22, verse 21. Let me get into the verses before this to, to make all this make more sense, I guess, of why this altar is so important in this situation. I'm going to stay right here. Um, right down the middle here is going to be the Jordan River. And we're going to call this the west side. What's up? <laughs> right, we're going to call this east side. I have absolutely no idea if this is east or west, but this is what we're calling it. Okay. And so when you get to Joshua chapter 22, all the battles have been fought in the promised land and they have divided out the land between the tribes and now everybody's at rest. There are two and a half tribes that are on the east side and the other ten tribes are on the west side. And so when they first crossed the Jordan to go fight Jericho, there was this whole explanation to the two and a half tribes on the east side. Your fighting men have to come with us and go fight until the rest of the tribes get their land. And once everything gets divided, then your men can then go back across the Jordan to your families and those two and a half tribes over there. And so what has happened in Joshua 22 is this is now that point. The land has now been divided. And Joshua is now saying to the two and a half tribes, all right, well done, you guys. You're now free to go back to the east side. And so they get released and they start heading to the east side. But before they cross the Jordan, they build an altar. Now news gets back to the ten tribes on the west side that they built an altar. And these guys are now freaked out. They're like, oh, no, they're going to worship some other god already. They've built an altar to, to, to offer sacrifices to God at this altar, which is only supposed to be at the altar before the tabernacle. God is not only going to punish them, but because they're going, we're part of us, he's also going to punish us. And so actually the ten tribes gear up for war to go fight the two and a half tribes on the east side. Are you with me? All right. So before this war happens, they send Phineas, Eliezer, who's the high priest. Phineas is his son. They send Phineas and a leader from each of the ten tribes. So these ten guys and Phineas go and talk to the leaders who have built this altar here on this side of the Jordan, the east side. And so what happens is in verse 21, you now get the response of these people who have built the altar to Phineas and these leaders of why they built this altar. And that's where we pick up in verse 21. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know if it be in rebellion or in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day, that we have built us an altar to turn from following the Lord or if to offer thereon burnt offerings or meat offerings or to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord himself require it. And if we have not rather done it for fear of this thing, saying, In time to come your children might speak unto our children, saying, What have ye to do with the God of Israel? For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you. Ye children of Reuben and children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come ye have no part in the Lord therefore said we that it shall be when they should say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings not for sacrifices but it is a witness between us and you you go to the verse, the last verse, verse 34 says, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad, they called the altar Ed. Which is just translated witness. It shall be a witness between us that the Lord is God. Very unusual altar in the Bible. Because most of the time you build an altar to offer sacrifices and worship to God. But that is not the purpose of this altar. You see, the people of the east, these two and a half tribes, what they were fearful of is that when generations, as time would move on, that the ten tribes...
But what they were afraid of is that as generations would come, is that these ten tribe people would say to the two and a half tribe people, you have no part in the Lord. And so in order to keep that from happening, what these guys decided is, here's what we'll do is we will build an altar, and this will be a witness between the ten tribes and two and a half tribes that we are part of the Lord. But here's the key being a witness. You go back to verse 28, and it says, Behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord. That the way that this altar was a witness is because it was in pattern with the altar of the Lord at the tabernacle. It was a copy. It was a replica of the actual altar of the real thing. So what would happen is that generation would say, you guys have nothing to do with us. And they say, we do have something to do with us. Let's go to the altar. And then they would come to the altar and these 10 tribes of the West would then look at the altar and say, hey, that's the exact same altar that is our altar where we worship God at the tabernacle. You see, in order for this altar to work, it had to be a replica of the real thing. In order for it to truly have a witness that would lead to worship, it had to pattern itself after the real thing. In order for you and I to have a strong witness for Jesus Christ that will lead others to worship, you and I need to have an effective witness through replication of the real thing. And the real thing is not some altar or not some building, but it is Jesus Christ himself. So in order for us to truly be witnesses of Christ, we need to be following the pattern of the real deal, which is Jesus himself. And so we just have a couple of things to then share on this replication of Jesus. Just two areas. You could go a hundred, but we're kind of long on time. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, brethren, be followers or imitators of God as his dear children, you know, replicating, patterning, and walk in love as Christ walked in love and gave himself for us, a sacrifice to God, the sweet aroma. If you want to know this morning, am I living a life pleasing to God? There is one filter you should start at the top, and that is, do I love people? As Jesus said this, the world will know that you, my followers, by how you do what to one another? By how you love one another. I am convinced that the church does not take love seriously enough. That it has become part of like when you go to the doctor and he says, you need to eat better and exercise. Yeah, I get that, doc, but what can you do for me? <laughs> it just becomes part of that, you know, we become kind of deaf to that sound, that, that tune. The greatest command that you could follow is to do what? It's to love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. The second is like the first, and that's to do what? Love your neighbor as yourself. It is to love. There is one word that fulfills the whole law of God. Do you know what that word is? Love. There's one word that summarizes the whole law of God. Do you know what that word is? Love. The Bible says without it you have nothing and without it you are nothing. The premier thing that you should be focused on as a witness of Christ that will be effective in replicating who he was, where should I start? There is no better place to start than am I loving people? Am I taking that serious in my walk with Christ? As he loved, am I loving? Let's play a simple word game. What is the opposite of up? What's the opposite of left? What's the opposite of good? What's the opposite of love? I understand that, but I would say there is a better word than the opposite of biblical love. The scripture says this is how we know what love is, that Christ gave himself up for us. 
So if giving yourself up is love, what is the opposite of giving yourself up? Keeping yourself, yes, which would be selfish. That the opposite of biblical love is selfishness. And so when you're doing the opposite of the greatest commandment, you're being selfish. Christ gave himself up for us. That is how we are to walk in love in the way that he loved and putting others ahead of ourselves. And man, that's a strong witness for our Savior when we do that to other people. Story number one is about Chong. I got the same problem, Neil. Still going through puberty. <laughs> I'm glad that's streaming online. <laughs> and so Chong was a, she wasn't a student, she was a visiting scholar uh, with us a few years back in the summer. She was just with us for a couple months. We started our summer English corner program. She was with us on our opening Memorial Day cookout. And uh, we had our Chicago-style hot dogs we were doing that day, and Chong brought her parents, who were visiting from China, and they spoke absolutely no English. Try telling somebody how to make a Chicago-style hot dog with no English. Does anybody know what ingredient you don't put on a Chicago-style hot dog? Ketchup. Ketchup. Then everything else you have in your kitchen goes on it. That's basically how that works. They're good. And so we did our Memorial Day cookout there, and as everybody was leaving and funneling out of our house, Chong stopped and she said, Tyler, I just want to thank you so much. My parents, they could not believe they had the opportunity to come to an American's home. So I was just so thankful for you being willing to have my parents with us here. And so I had Daniel, who was from Kentucky, as my first intern, and he was there that summer. And we were starting, that was Monday, we were starting Conversation Groups Tuesday. We had seven signed up for this conversation group, looking forward to it. And that nine o'clock that morning, only one showed up. Uh, when I was a pastor, I pastored the First Rule Baptist Church of Decatur for 10 years. I, I kind of played the numbers game. You know, how many were here this Sunday? How many were at the fish fry? How many were at the you know, trunk or treat or whatever? But in this ministry, I, I stopped playing the, the numbers game very quickly, realizing that as they get smaller, they, you can have better conversations. And sure enough, the one that came was Chong. And so we began to talk to Chong. And Chong actually was telling me about somebody she had met, and Daniel. And I'd met him before, too. He was a, or David. He was a guy that kind of does similar things that I did. And she said, I'd been to his house for a, a, some Bible stories. I said, what stories did you hear? I said, there was something about brides who didn't have enough oil, and the groom came. And it's like, I have no idea what it meant. <laughs> like, me either. I don't know either. I don't know this guy. And then she asked this question. She said, Tyler, can you tell me the relationship between Jesus and God? As a believer in Christ, you want people asking you that question. And especially if you're a person who knows this person has absolutely no idea. And you get to tell them, about who Jesus means and his relationship with God and what he means for you. And so we didn't see Chong for then a month, all of June. She's out on the West Coast traveling with her parents, and we're now having conversation group. And so on Tuesday, the second Tuesday of July that year, Chong shows up in our conversation group. And now the conversation is more just food and holidays and that kind of thing. So the conversation group ends. Everybody funnels out, but Chong stays back. And Chong then is standing here, and Daniel's standing right here next to me, and she says, Tyler, I need to tell you something. I'm like, all right, Chong. She goes, I've realized there's something missing in my life. She said, Tyler, you and Daniel have been so kind to me. She said, all the Christians I have met have been so kind. And this is her exact words. It must mean their Christ is kind too. I don't know what Christian she's met besides me and Daniel, but when we get to heaven, <laughs> high five. You were an altar of Ed. You were a witness that led to worship, 
through the replication of the real thing. And that's what God is calling us to be. You will receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you to be my witnesses. And man, that witness is so effective when it is patterned after Christ. Second area that I see the most that needs to be patterned is simply grace. I have met thousands of people across this world through this ministry. I've had hundreds of them in my home. And I've asked dozens of them this simple question, do you know what grace means? And I've gotten a resounding no every time. They simply do not understand the concept of grace. It's something that is becoming more and more aware of me that something the church really needs to to center in on is proclaiming and de- declaring the grace of God. It's something that is missing so much that people just simply think of the Christian faith as you go before God and either good or bad and then he accepts you into heaven and if you're bad then you go to hell and that's how it works, this kind of justice. And that is not the Christian faith at all. But it's based on the grace of God that no matter how bad you are, it doesn't matter because God has sent his son Jesus to erase it through his death. And that those people who have been embraced by that, that God has put that blanket of grace over their cold heart and they've been warmed that now they have that same blanket to then embrace the shivering souls around them. Story number two is of Xinhua and a guy named Gabby. Gabby's actually from Spain, Gabrielle. These two were in my conversation group. And Xinhua asked the question, who puts on the English corner? And it's from a Christian campus foundation. And he goes, oh, Tyler, I've, I'm, my family's Buddhist, but I've heard some Christian stories. I go, okay, Xinhua, what have you heard? And he starts to tell about a story of a, a really big guy. He's like, I don't know, but there's this really big guy. And Gabby's like, oh, that's David and Goliath. <laughs> and so I said, all right, Gabby, why don't you tell Xinhua what David? And so I let Gabby go ahead and tell the whole story of David and Goliath. And he does a great job. You know, pew, ah, and so then after that, Qinghua then asks a question. He says, that's a great story. He goes, but what does it have to do with Christianity? And Gabby goes, oh, that's a difficult question. And I'm like, my parents didn't pay for Bible college for nothing. Let's get into this. <laughs> and so I try to explain how the king and the covenant of the kings and how Jesus is the coming king. And that leads to the coming of Jesus through the, the birth, the virgin birth. And so Qinghua asked that question. How was Jesus born of a virgin? And Gabby's response, oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> so I then try to lead through why he's born of a virgin and what that means. And, and then Qinghua said this, Tyler, can you explain to me, is Jesus God or is he the son of God? You know what Gabby's response was? Three times. Oh, that's so difficult. <laughs> and so I try to explain Jesus' position uh, kind of through our theological framework of substitutionary atonement and just of the position as the Son of God being that which can take our sin. And I use Gabby as this example of somebody who stole a car and now he faces the judge and the judge sentenced him to 10 years, but I come along I take his 10 years, Gabby goes free, but I pay the punishment. And I say to Qinghua, that's who Jesus is. Jesus, as the Son of God, is the one who has died for our sins. That God has punished all sin eternally in death and hell. And I said, but God sent his son, Jesus, as the one who takes our sin, just like I took you know, the 10 years. But even though we're the one who deserves the punishment, Jesus is the one who takes that punishment. And this is exactly what Xinhua replied to me. He said, Tyler, that's not fair. <laughs> He's right. Yeah, that's right. But what is that? Grace. That is grace. <laughs> oh, how marvelous. Oh, how wonderful. That is grace. And that is what is so precious to us. And may we then replicate that. May it not just be something that we just soak in delivering to people, to person after person. Here's the name. My favorite student, her English name is Grace. 
I love the name game. I play it with a lot of my students because most of their names have meaning. Many of them are from Asia, and they usually have two Chinese characters, whether they're from Korea or Japan or Asia or China. And uh, it's usually like, you know, bright star or beautiful flower. Even my son, my son is from Korea. His Korean name is Young Jin, means superb, advanced. That's what they gave him. We named him Madden. It means hound, dog. <laughs> Sorry, buddy. We stuck with the M's. We have Mason, Millie, and Madden. But we weren't really going for meaning. Sorry there, bud. Uh, my name is Tyler. I don't know if there's any other Tylers, but we're just simply an occupation. We're not a name. We're one who tiles. I lived up to my name three years ago when I put backsplash on our kitchen. But my favorite name that I've come across is this uh, Korean woman. And she was, we visited her in Seoul, and her name is Gyun Yoon. I can't even say it correctly. And she said her dad named her, and they're believers. I said, oh, Grace said, what does Gyun Yoon mean? It says it means mirroring grace. Oh, man, that's a, a grace. That is a name that a, a father looked down at a daughter that was newborn and thought, man, I want you to mirror the grace of God. I'm going to name you mirroring grace. Man, that is wonderful. May we all be union. May we all be reflecting the grace that God has shown to us. May you and I live as these altar of Eds, this very peculiar altar in the scriptures that was not made for sacrifices, but it was made to be a witness that worship could take place for generations, but that its effectiveness of its witness was through its replication of the real thing. And may that be a commitment for us all, man. That's something that I'm praying now because I've seen how little people know about grace. That Man, may I be proclaiming that. May that be what I do. I have just this little niche that I get to play while I'm sucking air in on this planet. But I love my little niche. In the middle of cornfields in Illinois, there are thousands of people who come every year and they have no idea about Jesus. And I get to take them fishing. I get to have them over for Thanksgiving. I get to have my kids play games with them. I get to help, you know, I meted a lot of them. That's about how I speak to them, Chris. And they're like, why are you helping me with English? <laughs> Man. I absolutely love the niche that I get to play for the kingdom. That may I declare the grace of God by my actions, by my love, and then by my words, that you may know it. I'll finish with this. This summer, I had a conversation group online through Zoom. And there was a student, Yujia, she's from China, Joanna's from Brazil, and Psycho is from Japan. Yeah. First time she walked in, what's your name? Psycho, oh. <laughs> nice to meet you. It's really Psy and then Ko is kind of for a tradition that for girls. And so the conversation went right to, I talked about church camp. You just asked about church camp. What about the Bible? What's an important teaching about the Bible? I went right to Jesus and grace. I said kind of grace is the anthem of the Christian and talked about, you know, it's the song Amazing Grace. And then Yujia said, Tyler, could you sing that for me? I don't know what happened to my screen, but my face became really red all of a sudden. <laughs> and as I was getting the boldness to begin to sing Amazing Grace, uh, the, the Japanese, she began to hum the tune. She says, is that the tune? It's like, yeah, that's the tune. She says, I don't know the words, but I, I think I've heard that tune. And so then I sang the words of Amazing Grace to my conversation group that day on Zoom. And to me, it just so clearly illustrated to my heart that so many people have the tune of grace within them. They're just looking for somebody to come along and give the lyrics. And that's us. You have been given power 
when the Holy Spirit comes upon you to be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world.